Now let's move to another issue with the memory, right? One issue is that when I want to access a memory location, from the time that I request that access to the time that the memory comes back to me with that data, that there's a lot of time that has elapsed. That's the latency, right? That, that's a problem. But again, you could do something similar to what we did with pipelining, right? So even though uh, the latency is high, I could have more data coming back at periodic intervals. So what is memory bandwidth? So this is essentially the rate at which data can be moved between the processor and the memory. So note that this is not talking about the time it takes for the data to come back. This is talking about the total overall rate at which uh, things can be done. So for instance, uh, how long does it take to execute one instruction? It might take 5 nanoseconds or 10 nanoseconds or 15 nanoseconds. But the throughput that I get if I'm doing pipelining is one instruction being executed or completed every nanosecond, every cycle, right? Because I'm pipelining. So this is also similar. So let's look at some aspects of memory bandwidth. So how do you increase the memory bandwidth? So one simple way of increasing the memory bandwidth is, so you increase the block size. So earlier we were talking about a cache which was storing 4 bytes. So 64k cache was actually 16k entries each of 4 bytes, right? And this was essentially the B which was the word size or the size being returned by the memory. Now what I could do is that I could increase the cache size. So let's say that instead of 4 bytes, I start maintaining 16 byte cache entries. So this is something called the cache line size. How big my cache line is, right? So let's take a simple example. We'll, we'll take the example of a dot product code, uh, not matrix multiply, but let's, let's look at dot product, right? And let's see how it would perform under these two scenarios. So what would the dot product code look like? It would essentially look the same as that uh, innermost loop of matrix multiply, right? That's essentially nothing but dot product, right? So it would again look exactly the same, load R1 from an address, load R2, from, sorry, R3 from another address and then finally add into R5 uh, the product of R1 and R3, right? And then I, I repeat this again and I keep on repeating this. First let's look at this case where I have 4 byte uh, cache line size. What is the uh, performance I'm going to get in terms of flops? There's no cache reuse. This is dot product. This is not matrix multiply. So every time I get the data, it's going to have to come from memory, right? So this is going to take 100 nanoseconds. This is going to take another 100 nanoseconds. And then a few more nanoseconds for the multiply add and some address increments and branching and so on. So what is the flops? We've already computed this actually. I'm performing two operations in 200 nanoseconds. So I get a rate of 10 mega flops. Let's see how this changes if I have 16 byte cache lines. So now what happens is that when I do a load R1, R2, right? what comes into the cache? So what is being multiplied? AIK and BKJ. Well, this is dot product. So let me just assume AI times BI, right? So I'm loading AI. This is going to take 100 nanoseconds to execute. But what is coming into the cache at this time? Not just AI, but AI, AI plus 1, AI plus 2, and AI plus 3. All of them are in the cache. And when I execute this, load R3, this is again going to take 100 nanoseconds, but what do I get in the cache? I get bi, bi plus 1, bi plus 2, bi plus 3. So this has roughly taken me about 200 nanoseconds. 
But what about the next set of loads? In the next iterations, after a couple of more statements, I am going to have the next iteration, right, which is again going to have two loads. And then I'll have another iteration. And then another iteration. Right? How long is it going to take for these instructions to execute? Operand fetch is just going to be a single cycle fetch, right? It's going to come from the cache. So this is just going to take two nanoseconds. Two nanoseconds is just for the memory fetch part of it. And then there are some other overheads which I'm going to ignore for the time being. But roughly what am I getting? In about 200 nanoseconds plus a bit more, which I'm ignoring for the time being, I am performing how many operations? Eight, eight operations, eight multipliers. Right? So number of operations, so if I look at four iterations, the number of operations performed is eight, and the time taken is about 200 nanoseconds. So what is the flops rate I'm going to get? 8 by 200 nanoseconds, it's 40 megaflops. When we do this performance analysis, right, instead of doing this performance analysis for, like for instance, I was looking at one iteration and then I had to look at four iterations to do this analysis, uh, we typically do this analysis slightly differently. We use something called a cache hit ratio. So what is cache hit ratio? This is the percentage of memory accesses found in the cache, hit in the cache or served by the cache. So if I want to compute the cache hit ratio for this example that we just saw, right, what is the cache hit ratio? How many accesses were I making and what percentage of those were found in the cache? 75%, right? The first iteration I had to get it from the main memory, but the next three iterations I was able to service from the cache. So cache hit ratio is 75%. So what that means is for all the memory access times, instead of taking different memory access times, one nanosecond for three iterations, 100 nanoseconds for one iteration and so on, I can just work with a single quantity, uh, the average memory access time. And what is the average memory access time? That is nothing but the cache hit ratio 0.75 into the time it takes to access the cache, which is 1 nanosecond, plus 1 minus the cache hit ratio, that's the time it has to go to the main memory. And what is going to be the latency for that time? 100 nanoseconds. And so this turns out to be 25.75 nanoseconds. So if I just work with the fact that each memory access is taking 25.75 nanoseconds, I'll get the same rate. So let's just quickly see that. So what was happening over here? So now we only need to look at one iteration. I don't need to go across four iterations because I'm taking the average time, right? So if I look at one iteration, what is the number of operations being performed? Two, one multiply add, right? And what is the time taken? There are two accesses to the memory. So the time taken is 51.5 nanoseconds. Let me just approximate that by 50, okay? So what is the flops? Two by 50 nanoseconds, which is what? 40 megaflops? It's same as eight by 200, right? It's same as eight by 200. Again, I mean, we are using a lot of approximation, but that's fine. Yeah, because the kind of improvements we get are, you know, orders of magnitude, so it's okay to take some approximations here. So instead of four byte cache line size, now we said we'll have 16 byte cache line size. So how do you get a 16 byte cache line size? How do you load that data into the, into the cache? How do you load 16 bytes into the cache? So one option is that you increase the size of your data bus, right? Make your data bus broader. So earlier the word size was four bytes, I was fetching 32 bits at a time. Now what is it going to be? If I want to fill cache line sizes of 16 bytes, what's it going to be? 128 bits. But 
that's not practical. Okay, it's it's not practical to build such large uh, data buses. Uh, they are costly, right? And they take up space. But you want a cache line size of 16 bytes, right? You, we just saw how it helped us. So we want large cache line sizes. But at the same time, I don't want to increase the size of the data bus. What do you do in the architecture? So you essentially do some kind of pipelining, right? The so data bus size will still remain to be four bytes. So what happens is when you make a memory access, it takes about 100 nanoseconds to get the first four bytes into the cache, right? So that's that's just a part of the cache. So we filled up this part of the cache in the first 100 nanoseconds. Let's assume that we are working with a memory unit that has an operating frequency of 200 megahertz. So the operating frequency of memory is not the same as the processor, okay? It's, it's considerably slower. So we'll assume that we're working with a 200 megahertz uh, memory unit. So how much data can this provide? So it, it's going to provide you a word, the word size, it's going to fill up the data bus every five nanoseconds, right? 200 megahertz, five nanoseconds. So every five nanoseconds, it can fill up the data bus again. It will give you four bytes. So what will happen over here is that the first four bytes will take 100 nanoseconds to come. Then in this next five nanoseconds, you will get another four bytes. In the next five nanoseconds, you will get another four bytes. And in the next five nanoseconds, you'll get another four bytes for a total of 16 bytes, which fills up the cache line. Right, so this will take about 115 nanoseconds to get the cache line ready. Okay, that's the way typically uh, this works. The, the larger cache line sizes are handled. 